Um, I make a lot of shapes, but I like to make plates and platters. And one of the things that comes up is, you know, what what is a plate platter versus a shallow bowl? And that that's uh, you know could be debated a lot, but it doesn't matter. The person that buys it is the critical person in terms of that decision. And the person that makes it is next most critical. So if you want to make something that you want to call a platter, then I guess you can. But for me, based on <coughs> looking at various ones, one of the things about a platter that Dixing makes or Ray Key makes or, or uh, the plates that Mike Mahoney makes and eats off of in his kitchen is that they have a rim of, subs of substance. They, they don't just end in the, the, top, of the top of the bowl. They, they have more thickness than just um, what the wood uh, would provide otherwise. So you have to intentionally make one. Um, the, the rim gets bigger as you, as you go along. This one, a lovely piece of wood for me, but I am standing in my own way. This is a great piece of wood. I call it bonfire. It's really Donna, nice. Donna, if you just put it right on the <coughs> thing there. Really, Good. Yeah. I'm right out. Sorry about I'll the be. wires. It's really nicely figured wood. It's terrific uh, contrast to the grain and so forth. It does kind of look like a bonfire, prairie fire, or something, but the rim is too narrow. Turn the light on. Yeah. Turn, the light on. Turn that light on. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah. Better well, here. Certainly highlights some of the figure. Yeah. But the problem with this has nothing to do with the wood. I. I really think that, you know, the, the key, one of the keys is to find a really great piece of wood and not screw it up. And I screwed this one up. I mean, it, it hangs on my wall at home because I like it. But I screwed it up by not making a wide enough rim. If I'd made a wider rim, it'd be great. As it is, it's nice. So, um, one of the things I've done over time is to make sure I appreciate and learn what I think um, needs to be the, the sort of ratio. Um, I've got some other samples of failures of one sort or another in my mind, and, and it's my mind that matters if it's my platter that I'm making, but so here's a really early one here. This is a lovely piece of fun thing. There's nothing fancy about the piece of walnut. It has a way too narrow rim. It shoots right down to the flat bottom and skates across. It, there's, it's nothing. It, it's, it doesn't make any kind of an interesting presentation. There's a little bit of something interesting in the, in the rim, you know, here and there, but, but it's not wide enough to be attractive. And the bottom, in this case, I, I have kind of a two-stage thing. So I'm, I start from the rim, I'm turning it OG, and then I come to a kind of a donut. The inside of the donut is where I grabbed it with an expansion chuck. I've come to the conclusion there's no reason for that donut. So these days I come down and end the bottom right here. The bottom flows all the way across. I'll show you that in a couple of examples. Um, here's another. This this was a walnut um, platter. It also is too narrow. This is even bigger than that. Um, well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not bigger than the uh, bonfire one, but it's bigger certainly than the, the other walnut one. Here's the cross section that I had there. So there's there's this, again, the step in and this sort of donut thing here, which is incanted. I've got a little bit of relief there that it, it bellies down so the middle is thicker. I thought it needed that for rigidity. I don't think it does anymore. I can make this flat across and it works fine. As long as I have at least an eighth of an inch thickness here, and I use my four inch chuck, so the span, that four inch span, an eighth of an inch is fine. Um, here's, a, here's a pretty piece of white oak. You know, it's got a little bit of interesting, not related schmutz over here, a little bit of uh, quarter sawn flake. Um, it was pretty thin to begin with. Um, I didn't incorporate a rim this time, I sort of made the inside shape followed the outside shape. My conclusion was it doesn't it doesn't do the right job. It needs you need a rim that has definition 
I know where the rim is done, and I know where I'm starting into the uh, lower part of the flavor. So, so my conclusion from these other uh, tinkerings is that this isn't very appealing. This is too narrow. That's too narrow. Um, and and I want a wider rim. Here's a here's a double failure. This one is is um, not only is it uh, too narrow a rim. But it rocks like crazy. This thing, it curved like a rocking chair. Um, I'm not sure why quite. I think it might have been a little wet somehow. Um, it, it, it is not because that's the way the grain goes. The grain, in fact, goes the other direction, so I don't know why that is. But, um, but I think part of it is it was too thin. This cross section here that might have given it more substance is too thin. It's in the neighborhood of, it's barely a quarter of an inch there. So I've got a, a, an eighth of an inch or a little more here. I pretty much follow down to a quarter inch and I've got an eighth of an inch across. It's not enough to hold it together, in my opinion. So here's a, here's a new little piece that turned fairly recently, and just to measure that cross-section part, I like to measure it right side up. This guy, crosswise, is almost three-quarters of an inch. Um, it doesn't suffer by weight or unpleasant, uh, sort of surprising um, feel, but it's way more likely to resist any kind of curling effect because there's a lot of mass up here. I need the bottom to be um, uh, fairly thin, but there's no prize for making this section here thin, and there's a lot of benefit for leaving it thicker. So where I've come to is, uh, is that concept. Uh, let me show you something else where I have that one here. This is an earlier one. This is actually one, I took this out of my wife's uh, cupboard. It's the same size plate with a different size rim. Uh, so this one is an inch and a half, and this one is an inch and five eighths, and it's a ten inch, ten and a quarter inch uh, piece of plate or platter, whatever you want to call it. I call the small ones plates, the larger ones are platters. That's my nomenclature. But neither one of these is horrible. This is wider, that's narrower, there's more working space here. These are both of them oiled for use. So if you have a some couple of couple of chunks of cheese that you want to put on this plate and, and or this plate, there's marginally more room here. But neither one of them for me is now unacceptable. I'm okay with either one. Um, I can decide if there's something special in the rim I want to include or exclude. I can help make that decision, but in general. I like something that's in this range. An inch and a quarter is a little light. An inch and a half looks fine. This this looks fine to me as well. So for me, that's where I'm headed. And this one, to look at the bottom, uh, well, they're both the same. Well, more or less the same. But this one was hung, was um, mounted with the larger chuck. This is a stronghold chuck, about a five inch chuck. This is a Vic Mark, smaller chuck. It doesn't really matter. In either case, the bottom goes all the way out to the edge. As soon as the shape comes down, it becomes the bottom. So that's different than the one I showed you before, which came down and then came across and then had the little donut on the bottom. I'm doing this now because it leaves me more material. And that material is helping it stay stable. This one... This is the one that came from my wife's cupboard. And if it's going to rattle, it's going to rattle this way. And there is a slight rattle in it. I can tell. I don't know if you can tell that, but it's moving a little bit that way. It's never going to move this way, the long way of the grain. It's only going to move um, across the grain. You know, it's going to curl that way. Moved a little bit. Same would be true at the top. The top will move as well. Ah, that's moved more. But the last thing I do is the bottom. So if it's distorted a little bit in the top, 
it's not very noticeable because it doesn't sit that way very often, right? It, it needs to be flat on the bottom, as flat as you can make it. That's the last thing I do, but the top can move around a little bit if it wants to. I don't mind. This one's a little newer, less age, fewer washings. It's got a little something going too, side to side. But it probably has more this way if I could find the right spot. Yeah? See? But I don't care about the top, do I? I care about the bottom. So that's a little bit about the rim. Um, while we're at it, let's talk about a couple horn rim things. Before we get into it further. This one is another user. Oh yeah, we got a little more rattle. This is an older one. So it's moving a little more than it used to. And so it has it has another feature in it which um, enhances the the appearance, I think, and that's this uh, internal bead. Um, so the bead is turned in what would have been the inside corner right here, where the where the edge of the bowl, or edge of the, the um, downturn comes and meets a corner of the rim, I turn a bead there. It doesn't stick up, it's internal. So when I'm sanding on the inside, I don't hit it. When I'm sanding on the top, I don't hit it. Um, I don't, uh, it works pretty good. I don't usually use this shape in a user type bowl because I think it gives you uh, more places for food and stuff to hide. So usually if I'm going to make a platter or plate for using, I don't incorporate that, um, that bead. I did in this case, um, I guess we've survived it, but that's, I'll show you how I do that with the tool. This is an oak piece. This is notable because it was only three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, I generally would like to work with, if it's going to be a sort of a 10 or 12 inch uh, plate or platter, I'd like it to be at least an inch thick. If it's going to be 14 inch platter, I'd like it to be an inch and a quarter thick. But I need that much, in my mind, to present the thing in such a way that it doesn't uh, get too thin or unstable. But this one is, is the inside is following the outside shape. Not a necessity, and the thickness I use, the thickness doesn't have that heavy cross section. It's like a quarter inch thick in that what I think is a kind of a critical cross section. It's in the middle, right there. It's an eighth of an inch thick. Here in the middle, it's what do you want to say? Three sixteenths at the most. So I got away with uh, this. Thinner and flimsier than I might have. It's it's but it's quite oak, and it's, even though it's pretty old, it doesn't rattle that much. And I don't know if you can see this. If you if you can't see it, uh, there's a swirl here. And uh, I remember when I took this to the club, uh, someone might have been Paul Shutola at the time said, "Oh man, that really is cool. That swirl." That deserves special mention in the newsletter. I thought, well, terrific, because I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm finishing this. I'm right at the end of it. I'm trying to smooth up something on this middle section. And it's pretty thin, and the wood is pretty hard. So as I was dragging the gouge across there, and it might have even been a, a 3 8 inch gouge, so it, it had a little bit of wobble of its own, it took up uh, a little, a little uh, chattering, and generated that swirl. And I didn't send it out. So when you're going to replicate that? Yeah, I couldn't do that again. <laughs> I don't think I could do that again. But, but I'm happy that it happened and it, it stayed home with me. It didn't go anywhere. Um, but it isn't that you can't make it thinner. It's really that there's no reason to, and there's some risk in, it. especially with uh, risk more likely to be absorbing moisture. Um, this one, this is a pearl. This one is quite thick here. I measured it before. I think uh, it's a, it's almost an inch inch thick there. Um, I didn't I didn't intentionally make it that thick. I just 
I ended up with, this feels good for the shape on the outside, which I do first. And then I got it to the inside, and I said, well, I kind of like the way that works. And that's the way it came out. Um, when I got done, I thought, oh, my, I could have made that thinner. I could have, I could have come back here and made this flow longer so that, uh, so that it was flatter when it got out here. I guess when it's all done, I, I kind of wish I had. But you make that decision before you make the other one. And here, I kind of thought I was limited with this defect here. In a burl, you're never quite sure what's just beyond that defect you can see. And I wasn't inclined to want to ruin this thing, so I, I kind of limited where I, I uh, made this curve start on the back side. Um, at the end of the day, someone else will own it, and I don't think they'll mind very much, because it's a lovely piece of work. This, of course, is not a user. It's just going to sit on a, a uh, whatever, mantle somewhere, right? So it, it doesn't matter that much. It's not so heavy that it's clunky, because the burl itself is pretty light. So the fact that it's a little heavy doesn't hurt it that much, and you guys aren't going to tell anybody, or maybe one of you will just buy it. I don't know. <laughs> This was just to finish the sample parts. This this is the this hangs in the living room. I was getting ready to come and to the meeting, and, and my wife came to the kitchen and said, "Somebody's we've been robbed." So she saw that this was missing from the wall in the living room. So this is a piece that um, obviously has a lot wider room. I don't know what it is now, two inches or more, two and a quarter inches, almost two and three eighths. It's um, 19 inches big. I, it's the, it's the biggest dimension I can practically turn on this thing, because uh, it has to be a little bigger to mount. By the time I get done getting the edge sorted out, it's uh, it's as big as I can turn. And this piece, um, the figure is just amazing. And and for some of you that were up here and touching it, you can now, as it's aged, you can feel the figure because. A lot of the figured wood, as it dries, it sort of projects the figure in, in a tactile form. Uh, so um, it's, but it's really just about as pretty on the back side. Um, and in this case, for whatever reason, I decided I'm not going to make a, a, a corner, I'm going to make a round. But, the, but once upon a time, there was a recess here in which I mounted uh, the truck. If that recess is um, an eighth of an inch on one of these smaller plates, uh, I'll make it at least three sixteenths on this. This is hard wood, and and the chuck is going to fit really well in the recess that I make. So, um, so I turned this on that five inch uh, stronghold chuck with the dovetail joints. Okay, so enough of that. John, do you prefer the recess for? The decoration or versus a uh, versus a tenon. A tenon. Um, I think the tenon wastes thickness for me because if I turn a tenon and I want it to sit flat, I have to eliminate that tenon for sure. If I turn a recess, the recess may be part of what I can leave in place. Some economy, some economy. cases I've left the recess. Other cases I've made it flat. Whereas the big one, you just you took off the recess the, anyway. The big one, uh, frankly, you know, these none of these pieces are dead flat when you put them in. Uh, there's a little bit of wobble in them, and and uh, I used to flatten out the bottom of the piece before I put the recess in. I stopped doing that because it seemed to me it was just wasting wood. Uh, but I don't care if I have a recess and it's sufficient to hold it's at least an eighth of an inch, then I don't care if it's dead flat at this point. I'm going to re-flatten it after I've done the top and put it back and made that final cut to have it sit properly. So I don't see the need for doing that, flattening that board out in the first place. Um, so anyway, where am I in my notes? I've uh, jabbered it so of my notes. Somebody should tell me where I'm so what did we say? We said the platter is, uh, well, I say here, for the mathematicians, it's, it's a 
diameter versus height, the ratio of big number is a plate. If it's a 12 inch bowl and it's only three inches thick, that ratio is four. If it's a 12 inch platter and it's one inch thick, that ratio is 12. High ratio is a plate or a platter. Uh, if it's a really big one, it could be two and a half or three inches thick and it's still a platter as far as I'm concerned. Uh, also, Dick Singh would say, it doesn't have to be flat bottomed. It could be a shallow curve. They're very attractive. I think, I think they're nice. For me, um, in the plates, there are, there's a higher utility if they're flat bottomed because then I can argue, well, you could put your, your hors d'oeuvres in there, your cheese, and you could cut and against that surface that's flat. It's going to be, going to be happier than if it's a curved surface. But the other issue, frankly, is, and I, I know you said earlier that uh, flat bottoms are harder to do than bowls. I'm not sure that's true. I have a, I have a hard time with bowls, whether they're shallow curves or other time. I'm, I'm always fretting about where does the wood end and the space begin down there at the bottom. You know? So if I get this curve really nice, but it doesn't end right, uh, either it's flat or it's through the piece, that's not a good outcome. When I do a hundred platters, I'll, I'll be pretty good at making them flat. Maybe so, yeah. But for me, that's uh, th that's an easier thing. If I start out knowing where I'm at, given the recess I have, and I cut straight across, I've, I've, I've made it happen. It's a trick to cut straight across, but I know where I'm at. If I'm doing a bowl, that's a funny little space I have to keep measuring and sweating and fretting and so forth. So I have more trouble, frankly, with bowls than I do with uh, flat bottom platters. But, um, uh, but it, it does actually, it gets easier with uh, time. Uh, so the other issue, I think, for me, in terms of getting interested in this kind of product was you see a lot of nifty looking boards. And, and as a turner, you sort of go, what the hell can I make out of that board? And a, a plate or a platter is one of those things. And, and that, when we're looking for nifty stock to begin with, because it's easier to sell nifty stock than it is boring stock, then you see a fancy board, you'd like to make some of it. That's what kind of got me going in that direction. The other thing is, just to put this in your mind, in case you're saying, well, I don't have a 12 or 25 inch, 28 or 4 inch lathe, I, I just have maybe a mini lathe to work with. This, this is a wine caddy, wine bottle caddy, I'm sorry. So, so if you have a wine bottle and you're a linen tablecloth and the red wine is dripping down the neck, you put it on that caddy, if it gets to the bottom, that wine's just going to stain the caddy and not the linen tablecloth. Uh, or, if you're not a drinker, it might be a candy dish for the card game, you know. It's got nuts or nuts or something else tasty in it. And, and it's the same concept that we're going to look at today in terms of turning a platter, except it uses a, a fraction of the wood. And it, it has a different outcome, and you don't have to have as big a lathe. So keep this product in mind as we're looking and going through the platter, because it's just like it in many respects. The biggest difference is there's no prize for this being flat because almost every wine bottle has a cavity. So if it's if it's domed in the center, who cares? Doesn't matter. The bottle's not going to mind having a dome that is a lot less uh, significant than the one that's in the bottom of the bottle. So, and once again, I'm, I'm choosing a piece of wood that has some appeal in the figure. In fact, there's more appeal in the bottom than there is in the top. And these are good sellers. And if you have, if you have a, you've made a platter out of this same cherry, and now you've got a wine caddy, suddenly you have a wine and cheese set. That's a wonderful wedding gift or something like that. You know? So um, these things are nifty. And as I say, not everybody that buys them, and I sell kind of a lot of them when I have a show, they, they aren't just for wine caddies. They're for other things. <coughs> One more thing before we go on. Here's two boards that I took out of my stack, which are mine. I put them aside. If I had a board of cherry that had this curly pattern across it, this is the best out of that board. 
It's mine. I keep it aside. But everybody that brought platters out of that same board thought they were pretty cool, and they were. There's a best one in every board you want to buy. Well, whether you keep it or sell it to somebody or give it away is another question, but none of them are bad. There's just one that's better. It's the same with this curly oak. So they're part of my, someday I'll do it for myself, or my granddaughter or something. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, oh, and I should say, sorry, I meant to say, that big platter came from a supplier out in um, Vancouver, southern Vancouver, just across the border, uh, Bow River, Bow River, I forgot what the last one, maybe it's Bow River Lumber, I don't remember. It's the same outfit that's supplying the figured maple blanks to Rockland. The, the ones that are there, the various sizes, and they're graded AA, AAA, and so forth, that's the same supplier. They sell bigger ones as well. That platter, that blank um, in Canada was a hundred bucks. So when I ship it, it adds a couple of bucks to that. But if you want that platter, you can you can find it. Uh, otherwise, you're looking for boards uh, that, are, that are attractive. And the, the last a while back, Rockler had a bird's eye sale. Going. I was out at that other store in Bolingbrook and bought a board out there. I got some great this size or so cherry. It's not it's 15 16 thick, it's not an inch, but I can live with that for this for this diameter. It was lovely figured uh, bird's eye at that sales price of what four or five dollars a square foot or four or five dollars a square foot. It was pretty good. So so sometimes you find it and I, I say if you if you find a nifty looking board, that's when you buy it. You don't go, you don't go looking for a nifty looking board because you'll never find it then. But if I if I want a nice piece of cherry, I have to buy it when I see it. I can't go find it when I want it. So, so I'm a collector of wood, so are some of you. Okay, so how do we how do we do this? Um, the, well I should I should say I should talk about the river a little bit more, I guess. I talked about how wide it should be. It should be incanted a bit. Uh, it shouldn't go uphill into the platter. It should go downhill into the platter. It doesn't have to be a lot. In fact, if it's a thin piece of wood, if you're kind of on the thin side, you'll want it to be a very slight incant. Otherwise, you won't have any differential between the rim and the depth of the platter. Uh, so it makes a little difference what you're working at. Um, it can be slightly curved. Uh, you just don't want it to curve a lot because that's not altogether the feature. That's just one of the aspects. That's the frame to the picture. So you don't want to make it the whole the whole story. I draw a circle on the back of this blank. When I put it up here before I cut the back side of that rim, I'm going to draw a circle on there, give myself some comfort that I think I know what size rim I'm going to end up with on the other side. I just do that for myself. Um, and I'm perfectly willing to disobey what that circle tells me if I, if I want to, but it's something to start with. Um, how do you decide what the right width is for a rim? Um, look at uh, the china you got as a wedding present. And that was pretty nice stuff. Uh, the schmucks that did that didn't just do it yesterday. It's been going on for a long time. They really know what makes a plate or a platter look nice. No reason to reinvent the reel. Just uh, measure that plate and see what the rim looks like and say, well, does that look nice or does that look too much? Measure another set, you know, whatever the case may be. So if you, that, there's that. There's also books like Ray King is a, is a public author of some note, and he has a lot of pictures in here. Of, well, not a lot, but some pictures of platters. You can measure the rims that he put on, and if it pleases you, that's that's good information. So no need to invent. You can uh, have a look at what else has been done by others who may be more practiced at it than you are. Uh, you can look the last one he turned, like I have looked at the, and said, no, I don't like that last one. I turned it wasn't wide enough. I'm going to do something different the next time. And the other issue is you, you want to sometimes take into account what features are there in this wood that I want to be in or not in. Uh, 
that uh, that surface that it will be the rim. So don't. Um, it's not just one issue that's involved. Um, the other kind of thing is is the detail that you put on the rim. Uh, you saw this online bonfire. On my bonfire maple platter, I have this flat rim, and I go to a protruding rim, and then I dive into the bowl. Um, there's another uh, feature like that that may, that may be a protruding rim, and then a flat that's a continuation of this rim on the inside. Um, those are neat, but they're a bitch to do. Um, because um, you got to sand up to this damn uh, edge of this peak. That's a pain. And if you put another section of the rim on the other side, you have to sand up to both sides of the beam. It's, it's, uh, it's an inside corner. Uh, and it's frank, not worth the effort. The alternative um, to accomplish more or less the same effect is this beam. This is dead easy to do, and there's no sanding issues. If we have a chance, we'll, I'll, I'll turn that, but I'll, I'll show you how it's done, even if I don't do it. So, those kind of different things, and you can burn it, you can carve it, you can do all the kinds of things that make it unique or interesting, or, as I say, take advantage of what it has to offer. If it's really highly figured, maybe you sh shouldn't do anything in terms of the mulch. Maybe, if it's pretty boring, maybe you figure, figure out some way to make it more interesting. So, generally speaking, I don't put beads in bird's eye. That really doesn't doesn't help that much. It's not necessary, and it's a little bit can be a little bit challenging if the eyes start popping a little bit. Um, I mentioned I sort of glossed over in other respects functionality and um, the form. How stable is it on the table? Can you you feel good about picking it up? Your fingers fit in there. Or you feel like it's going to fall? Is it slippery? Is it slipping down, or is it flat enough for your fingers to be happy uh, picking it up? Um, I, I said I like to go straight into the table. You may like a different shape. You may like the OG shape. I won't uh, discourage you about doing. It. Okay, so let's uh, do something. So here's a piece of cherry that's kind of nine and a half or two inches long. It's about as small. A plate as I really want to turn. It's just as much work to turn a plate that's eight inches as it is nine inches, and I can sell the nine inch one for a little more. So, uh, unless I got a great piece of wood to just beg them to make something out of it, I don't go much smaller than the nine inch. Um, so, I, I decide which side is up. Um, I decided this side is up in this case because, I don't know why, I guess because I've got this little. Uh, what do we call these uh, inclusions in cherry? Swing uh, shank? I can't. No, I can't think what what to call them. Sap. Sap. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, this is about some, and and it may have some in the finished rim, or it may not. I don't know, but I can't tell until I get there. And so it's got that. It's got a bit of figure. The the bottom is figured too, so this bottom is going to be closer to the bottom of my plate than this is going to be. So. But I like this, so I drilled the hole there, and now I'm committed. So this hole is like, uh, uh, I don't remember how thick it is. I think it's, uh, I think it's just about three eighths inch uh, deep. You don't want it to be too deep because you want to get under it with the bottom of the surface of the plate. But you want it to be deep enough to give you a reasonable grip on it. This screw here. This is a glazier chuck. I don't know if you can buy these anymore, but you can buy something like it. Uh, it does that. It does this. And, and you can adjust the depth of this screw, except you can't make it any shorter than it is right now without setting it off. So I put in that spacer that lets it only be 3 eighths of an inch effectively. And the other alternative for these screw chucks, the screw, uh, yeah, screw chucks, is you can use the insert that's available on your four jaw chuck 
It's bigger than this, but it's a similar kind of screw. It's sharp, so it cuts instead of um, chewing uh, the wood. It cuts in and it holds fairly well. If as long as you have um, Now, as long as you have a piece of board that's reasonably flat, this one isn't flat, I'm a bar. Uh, as long as you have that, you can use this. Because when you make it tight, it's reasonably stable against the flat surface. If it's really cupped, then you can't use this approach. You've got to use a faceplate with maybe some shims so that it doesn't wobble on you. Because uh, you're, you're going to establish the bottom and that's going to establish the rest of the uh, configuration. So you don't want to have a wobbly uh, surface when you're turning this. But that's the starting point. And what we're going to do first is, because I said for you to do it, um, I'm going to put a little line on there. So I'm going to make a reference mark there at an inch and three eighths. And now, I stand back and see, is that, is that a rim that I'm going to be happy with if it were on the other side where it would be someday? And if it is, then that could be my guide as to how I turn the bottom. I'm going to do from this side now is pretty fancy. My, my lathe, my old one doesn't have a readout. I guess I can have one. The only time I like to use a mask is when I'm doing this. I cut from the from the top so I don't leave any broken edges. It's not round yet. And it's not cutting real cleanly, so Now I want to know where the top is actually going to be. So if I'm relying on this orientation, I want to establish where the top is. I'll do that just by kissing it until it sounds relatively continuous. I'll see if there's a mark all the way around, if I could see. There, maybe I can use that. Yes, mark over there. So that establishes a flat surface that I'm going to go to when I say I'm finished with the thickness of the rim.
Now I'm going to shear scrape this edge, <clears throat> which where I hit the end grain, it's um, a little tear off. So I'm going to shear it. This wouldn't have to be flat. It could be rounded. That's that's a kind of a nice feel and a nice look. It could be um, angled this way, so that it's slightly larger at the top than it is uh, at the bottom of that edge. But it can't be the other way. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. It looks bad. And the other one is when I get done and I want to grip this from the top, I just as soon not have it angled in that direction. I'd like to have it angled this way. So. Now I'm going to shear scrape. Whoops. What was that sound? Same as that one. Well, so this will be an experiment in... Okay. That was not well done. <laughs> I think that happened because I wasn't shearing enough. I had it too flat. But happily I have another piece we're going to use for the next stage, so I don't need to worry about that right now. It looks like though that nifty sort of street business is going to be in somewhere because it's showing in the bottom here. That's unforgivable there, but so now I'm going to make the mark for my Chuck, and I've set these dividers pretty much pretty close to a closed chuck diameter. Probably going to turn this down because it's not going to be flat. So it'll be harder to uh, make the point right. Okay, I know which one that's going to be. You can't, obviously, when you do that with the dividers, you can't use the, you can't let the far side drop. This is by Packard Tool Works. It's a dovetail scraper. Sorry, dovetail scraper. So it's going to be used to, to cut the inside dovetail in this uh, recess that I'm going to cut here, which needs more speed. Now, I'm going to present uh, the scraper in this form because I'll get a little bit smoother cut. I'm not going to go flat as I usually might. Wiggle it side to side till I get about as deep as I want. then I would keep cutting with this scraper on across and eliminate this middle section. You don't have to do that. If you're a little bit nervous about the way things are going to end up later, you can leave that in and it might help reinforce what's otherwise a pretty thin bottom. Um, but if you're going to take it out, now's the time to do it because you'll never have exactly this orientation again. It won't remount with exactly that orientation. Um, so I can look across here, see that it's relatively flat, that incision is relatively flat on the bottom, and it's about, it's about an eighth of an inch deep, which is enough if you're not going to do anything as violent on the top as I did on the bottom. If you do what I did here, on the other side it might uh, pull it out of the chuck. But, um, and just to check it before you take it off the screw center. See if I made it big enough after all. I did. 
Um, it could be a little bigger than that, but generally speaking, if you if you engage this chuck with the jaws fairly close together, you'll get the best circle, the most accurate circle, the most contact all the way around. Because when this thing was made, when this jaw was the jaw set was made, it was made as a whole unit, and then it was sawed apart. So there should be space between it for it to be a perfect circle. And it, it shouldn't be, you know, like way the hell out here. Because the further out you go, you start contacting here and here, and this is, never mind, you're bridging that. So you're not holding with all of the chuck that you, all the jaws that you should. So, um, the other thing I would do now is I would uh, sand, sand this surface here. I wouldn't bother with this part, but I would sand the edge and the surface I just created, the bottom side. And I would go ahead and sand it up to the, the finished sanding that I would do it. That would be for me, um, in this case, it would be uh, 600 because I'm going to use um, these for food bowls and I'm going to oil them so I want it to be especially smooth. If it's going to be a film finish, I would often stop at 400 because I think film finish needs a little bit of tooth to stick to it. So I don't, I don't think sanding it to 600 is beneficial if you're going to apply a finish that you expect to try to find a place to bite. So, but this is now the, the finished and sanded version of what I just messed up. And I'm going to put this chuck on. It's a bit marked chuck. Most importantly, it's dovetail jaws. A nice job repairing that. What? A piece yeah. of wood. It yeah. turned out better than you thought it would. So we'll put this in here. Get that right, but you know, it doesn't have to, you don't have to turn it very far to realize you went the wrong way. It's nice of you to point that out. Really. <laughs> so now that now the job is twofold, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut the rim as far in as I want it to be, and then I'm gonna make the incision to the bottom of the um, eventual plate. like something to hmm, a little more wobble in there than I kind of expected. Thought maybe I had some in the dovetail position there, but I don't. This inside isn't wobbling nearly as much as this outside, which was never flat in the first place, so off we go. You have this on the um, no side of it. Yeah. I'm kind of go no, I'm going by noise, and it isn't running fast enough, but it right. sounds like it is. So. So I think I said I wanted to do an inch and three eighths. I'm not quite there. It's an inch and a quarter, and I haven't quite got the right thickness yet to go to the edge that we established before.
cuts about the right width, but it's not quite flat. That's the other thing that's so I have to nibble that a little bit. Because if I'm if I'm not able to do it that way, then I take one of these long sweep gouges and shear scrape it. I have to wait till it gets up there. That's how we would get it flat. If it didn't get it flat, we're going to move on. Eh, it's not too bad, but uh, now I'm going to make the <coughs> incision. The way I'm going to make that is incision. I'm going to start like this. Once I get a um, a ledge in there, I'm going to rotate the tool, start cutting like this, and then I'm going to rotate like that. So in the process, I'm going to do an, in, an inward curve and then a flat at the end. I'm going to start out here and work up to the edge that will eventually be the right one. Take the measure. This is a nifty tool. I don't know where to buy another one. It's made by Woodfast. It's Australian, and it's metric. But you know, so. I am right now a little thicker than I want to be. I'm around 3 8 and I'd be happier if I was sort of 5 16 I'm allowing for an eighth of an inch already in the recess that I have, and I'd like to end up with an eighth of an inch at least in the thickness of the plate over that recess. And then maybe I need a little bit of a something, a little bit of a something for the fact that things may not go well. So, so I, I could be a little bit deeper than that, but um, what's happening in here? Wouldn't hurt. I'll go a little deeper. What the heck? Oh, wait a minute. I should, I should make sure I know where I'm at in terms of the uh, depth of the, uh, or the width of the uh, rim. Yeah. A little bit bigger than I said I would do, so maybe I'll take another pass on this. So I didn't go for much depth, but I was trying to make a little bit better surface and um, it's kind of okay, I think. Now there's a magic. I could screw around forever um, trying to get a really perfect incision there that has a nice wall, nice continuous surface and so forth. And I've, I've done that. I've screwed around a lot trying to get that done. But here's the magic if you want to not screw around too much. It's uh, it's an ordinary half inch, I guess, scraper, and I rounded it on one side, because I can't think of why 
as a bowl turner, base plate turner, I can't think of why I need a round-ended scraper. If I was doing spindle work, maybe. But I can't think of why I need a round-ended one here. If I have a, a, a cove to make, I can make a cove, but I'm not planning to make it with a scraper. So I've flattened this, uh, or I've curved this all the way to the point here, and now I'm going to set it in here, not flat, but at an angle. And I'm going to use it to shear the start of the flat and the curve up to the edge of the rim. I might make a couple of passes to do it, but when I'm done, I won't have to worry about much sanding on that. So that's not big chips, that's sort of dust and fine shavings. And it isn't quite right. I don't. Can you, you can see that there's some uh, low spots in there, some low grooves that didn't come out. So I have to make a couple of more passes. Don't don't get aggressive with the scraper. Just make more passes. Anytime a scraper squawks, that's not good news. It should make a kind of a shushing, searing sound. So still a little bit of something there. I'm going to make one more pass just to, as I say, that's famous last word, one more cut, right? That's going to be good enough whether it is or not. Okay? Because I want to show you what, how you do that bead. Um, because now is the time to do it. And I might you know, get some of that center out of the way before we do that. So this, uh, this is a pyr pyramidal tool, sometimes it's called, I think, seems accurate enough to me, pyramidal, it's round, but it's sharpened with a point, and it has three sharp sides. So not only can I go in like this as a scraper, uh, I can also turn it a little bit that way, and the incision I make is not as wide. And then if I want to refine what I'm working on, I can turn it on edge and I can sort of shear scrape with one of these three edges. And when I want to sharpen it, I have this hex nut on the bottom with a set screw in it. And this face right here coincides with that face on the, on the round bar. And similarly, here's a face that coincides with that one. So when I put this on the tool rest, on the edge of the tool rest, and mount and, and register against that hex nut, I have a repeatable sharpening of this point. That hex nut is not my idea. It was Dick Singh's idea. I executed it, but, which was for me a big deal, you know, because I was able to drill a hole and tap it and put in the set screw. So I think that was enough for me. I'm not a machinist, but it was Dick's idea, and it was a good one. So anyway, I would be doing a little sanding and so forth on the surface, but to show you how that bead works and how easy it is, um, first I'm going to do the top side. I'm going to try to do this, and you won't be able to see what I'm doing very well, but I'll, I'll try to stay out of my way. All right? So I'm going to do I'm going to come over here. And then I'll connect the dots.
I'm not sure how round that is, but if it wasn't round, I'd work on it longer. I think it's pretty close. Uh, it needs a little sanding, and maybe I would worry about sure scraping a little bit in spots prior to sanding. Uh, but generally, I, I should have, I intended to manage to get this surface right here of the bead below the surface I'm going to sand here on the rim. So that when I'm sanding the rim, I'm not messing up the bead. And if I didn't succeed in doing that, I'll mess around with this until I do. And I've also got an easy separation for sanding the inside because I have a kerf there. And so I have a place to sand up to without sanding into the bead on the inside of the platter. And that gives me a decoration without fussing and fuming like I had to do with that silly protruding bead. And I'm, it's an easy sand. No problem either way. Sanding inside, sanding outside is easy. This is not a hard tool to make or, well, this one's bought actually, obviously. So, um, but but here's, this is the key because if you can't sharpen the pretty thing, in a reasonable way, then it's not much use. There are other pointed tools out there that accomplish the same mission. Some other uh, big name turners use different tools, but they tend to have one edge instead of three edges. And these edges are key to refining that um, that bead. So, Don, Don, would you would you sand that bead just in case the platter is going to move on your? Oh yeah, I'm, gonna move. sand it before you went on. Yeah, I, I'm going to sand the rim all the way down to hand sanding, and I'm going to sand this bead all the way down to hand sanding before I before I take out the center. Because as soon as I take out the center, this is going to start to wobble. Right now, it's still pretty true, but it won't be when I remove this mass here in the change. And and at that point, you're doing this, you know, with your sanding exercise, and and it's. Um, it's not a good outcome. So there's no reason to proceed without sanding. Uh, particularly when I already have one here uh, that's been sanded. You'll pardon me if it's not cherry. Um, but this piece has already been sanded. Um, this edge has been sanded. I've even messed around a little bit with this interior. The back is the same as it was before. It's a little bigger plate, and this is ambrosia maple instead of cherry. And uh, I picked this because I ran out of cherry, and and I learned something a long time ago. I watched Richard Graff, and I think I watched him at the Hickory Hills Woodcraft. That's how long ago he was there, and he was turning cherry stuff, and I was pretty new at turning, and he was doing a fantastic job. Shavings were flying, he was getting a clean cut, it was just wonderful stuff. I eventually found out it was green cherry. And, and I've heard, I don't know this for a fact, but I've heard that when he would come to a demonstration like that, he would insist on green cherry because he liked the way it behaved. And it cut nicely and it was, it was kind of gave him the least surprises. So this is relatively soft wood. Uh, and, and so I picked it to turn out the center in case something goes wrong. I, I work on the center with a number of different tools. This, this is a really sort of bastardized, um, why can't I think of his name now? Ellsworth grind. It swung back, you know, it's not a textbook thing, but, but it gives me, uh, a cutting edge that I can guide across there in a way that works for me. If there's a different tool that works for you, then that's the one you should be using. Some people, and I haven't mastered this one yet, some people use this, what do you call this grind? You use that some. Straight across? Yeah. Flat grind? That's good. Bottom, for, bottom feeder? Right, bottom feeder. That's a better, that's the name I've heard. This is good for this flat stuff. There's no, uh, we're trying to shear the flat grain. That's a different job than we do when we're cutting the side of the bowl. And so in this case, when all the work we're doing is on that flat grain, this tool does a really nice job of leaning a good surface behind if you can figure out how to make it work. And I'm still figuring out how to make it work. 
Thank you. need to stop once in a while and see how you're doing because every cut you're making now is a practice for the last one you're going to make at the bottom, right? And you want to get good at that before you get there. This is kind of not as flat as I'd like it to be, but it's not terrible. And, and the other thing is, if you're like me, you'll find that the center is more likely to be domed than divoted, if you know. That's good, because if it's domed, you can sand it off. If it's divoted, you're screwed. Um, so, better a dome, and I think it's because as you go across, and you go at the same speed, this is, it's rotating slower, it tends to push the tool out, so it ends up domed. I think that's a natural thing. feel like I've mastered that tool, and uh, it'd be nice if I had. Still domed a little bit. Not going to fuss about it, but if I wanted to straighten it out or practice straightening it out, I could. I can come along here where I think it about starts. Now it's a little bit, it's a little bit recessed. It's a little divot in the center, so keep practicing. Uh, if you take more than an eighth, uh, for me, it's more destructive than productive if you take more than an eighth. Tells you if you're pushing it too hard, doesn't it? So you don't have to measure it each time, and I didn't, so now I'm really concave. Sometimes if you're really concave, the easiest way to fix it is to come back this way. I don't think I fixed it enough. Wait till the weight stops, make it hold of that. Didn't fix it enough. It's alright. We'll do it this way. I'm on the right track. Yep. We'll make a few more cuts fast. Still a little bit dull, but again, I don't mind that too much. Take a look at this surface here, though, using this tool with the with the um, cutting surface fairly straight. It should be getting a reasonable slice. Now I'm going to try to make a pass with this bottom feeder and show you how it's probably worth learning to use.
Gee, I hope this is different. Won't be a successful demonstration, will it? Huh? It's not very different, is it? Still going to be sanding going on there. Maybe if somebody gave me one of those CBN wheels, my tool would be sharper and it would be a good little better surface. What do you think? You want it sharper? No, I don't want the plastic one. We don't want to spoil it. Sometimes the six-inch roll is too too long. Actually, that's pretty good now. Uh, this could be a pen blank. You don't have to use a six-inch roll. It could be anything that you've cut, any scrap that's nice and uh, straight, flat, has a corner that you can lay up against this and uh, define your accuracy of the uh, circuit. space to go now. I need to see if it really is flat. Not bad. Let's see if this other tool is flat. Should be the same, the same edge on a different tool. Sometimes it matters. I pretty much like to have at least two of everything sharpened exactly the same so when I get to this stage in the piece I don't have to go over to the grinder. I have another one that's sitting there that I already sharpened. Because it's not so important to sharpen the tool when you begin the cuts. It's kind of important to sharpen the tool with the last one. So now I'm going to use the sharp tool for the last couple of cuts. I think I have a dome. And a little bit of. Oh, that's amazingly flat. Take my word for it. No. It's, it's amazingly flat, except that it's a little dome in the center. You can, you can raise this a little bit off center, and you can see where that dome starts. You're going to see it vertically, but you can translate that to the horizontal and that's where you can start your flattening cut if you want to make one because you can see where it stops uh, rotating but I have a little problem with the transition here from the the edge so I'm going to have to make another kind of fine pass to make that turn out right one last cut right again Got a little bit too much bevel in there, so I'm bouncing a little bit. Now I can show you the magic trick. <coughs> this little device here is, I wrote it down, Digital Surface Reconciler. It's available on my website, these things. This is 1095 plus shipping and handling. 
<laughs> and that little device, and you can make it out of MDF too, actually. Bill, you can, it can be made out of MDF, it doesn't have to be real wood. It's rounded in the corner so it doesn't mess up this, but I want to, I, I use it to see where the high spots or low spots are. And, Digital digits. This is why I picked the soft wood, right? Takes longer with white oak. Sometimes I I really don't do much of any power standing because I'm happy enough with the surface I end up with with this thing here. That's 180 grit, old Norton 3X, not the new craft they're selling now. Oops, sorry, better not put that on the internet. Not, uh, I like the old product better. Let's put that one. The yellow stuff, the new stuff is blue. I don't think it holds up as well. It must be better for some purpose, but it doesn't make me as happy as the old stuff. I'm a big fan of the old version. Here's the new blue stuff. No reason to get stingy with your sandpaper when you're working up a sweat, right? So the sharp stuff works the best, whether it's sandpaper or the turning tool. So I think the best idea is to use the sharp stuff. Um, that's flat and it's dangerously close to being flat in the middle, but it's not quite. So a little more work at the same short, and you'd be flat all the way across, even before you go to the power sanding exercise. Sanding block is not a new idea, but it's not one we use very much in uh, turning. It's still high. I would work on that until I, made, I was happy that it was flat. Uh, because if you're going to be using it for some reason. You'd like it to be flat to coincide with the cheese knife, cheese spade, whatever you're going to use. And otherwise, if you put a film finish on, you can see the imperfections. You can see a dome, or what I call a donut. So if it's low here versus this place and that place, that's what I call a donut. That's really visible with the finish on. Not so visible with oil, but pretty visible with the film finish. Okay. Show you what I would do next. I don't think I'll do it. So here is behind the curtain. This is a finished inside, sanded, finished outside, and all I have to do now is this back side. And the way I would do that is with I. You can use if you don't have jumbo jaws. You can certainly use a jam chuck, um, MDF to a precise. Um, diameter that you can force this into. Um, but I use the uh, jumbo jaws because they're quicker. And good enough. So this is my larger chuck. This is the stronghold chuck that has the five inch dovetail sometimes I'm using. You're all familiar with how the jumbo jaws work, right? Not right? Looks good. So I happen to already have this all the buttons set pretty close to where they need to be for this. I put it in, I tighten it up kind of gently, jiggling it around to make sure I'm... And then I'm going to operate on this to um, eliminate the dovetail. I'll usually use a scraper, a flat scraper for that. Oops, one more. A flat scraper, a little guy. Go in there and <coughs> eliminate the dovetail because there's no advantage in showing that still.
comes to trials. Then I can sand that. I can use that same tool and put a bead in there. And otherwise, I'm going to operate with one or another of these gouges to flatten it out. up with no beating there anyway. So that's again a, a case of checking to see that it's, I don't have to go all the way across. I can pick a point here and see that I'm incanted, I, that I've relieved it. And I can work on that with the same kind of scraping tools and shearing tools that I used before. I should, having given Reiki some credit in, in the uh, beginning, I should show you his shear scraping tool, which I've seen him use some and it seems to work well for him, is a bit rounded, bird, and then you present it at an angle. I think it, it works pretty good. It's, it's uh, an alternative to using a shear scrape with your gouges or with the long flute, or the long uh, cutting edge gouge. This, I would probably, I would probably reconcile this into uh, a continuous surface. I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave there any sign of the recess from the uh, chuck. Because it's pretty close, I can, I don't have to go very far to make that happen. And, uh, and that's equally presentable for me than, uh, and a lot easier to sand than putting a bead and stuff in there. So, hey, what's, are there any questions? Did anybody, did I ramble on enough for all you to get the answers you were looking for? Anybody fall asleep? Did we end at the same place? Well, if you took the recess off, would you have a little bit of a dish to it to let it set on a table so you wouldn't have it bowing? Yeah, this, this is going to be, from this edge, it's going to be, it's incanted. There's, there's a significant uh, difference in that. Um, and and the, whether I dome the center or not doesn't matter very much. It's still going to be below the outside. I'll be checking that with a longer straight edge. Um, even the gouge is a straight edge argument. So, yeah, even the center is under, under the uh, edges at this point. So. I used to like to put the beads in the bottom. <clears throat> then I discovered that if I if I reduced the amount of the recess, I often didn't have room for the beads, and I decided they were, you know, extra work anyway, and maybe not appreciated as much as the work I put into them. So I'm not fussed if I end up in a situation where it doesn't have a bead. And on the other hand. The bead doesn't have to be small, it can be a very large radius bead and still make a similar presentation. So you don't need a lot of depth difference to create a bead. You just don't go as deep with it and you don't, uh, you make it wider rather than narrow. Any other questions? Any other questions? Did you vacuum the chuck rather than using uh, Good question. Um, I, I have tinkered around with that, and what works best for me is, uh, that I've tried so far, is if I, if I make uh, a jam chuck, but don't get too fussy about how tight it is, just a good location, maybe not good enough fit to um, stand up against the rigors of cutting tools, and then I, and then I put the vacuum chuck with a hole in my uh, jam chuck, and and I seal up the uh, around the faceplate with um, silicone glue. Then I get a pretty good vacuum hole on this faceplate. Uh, the, the only downside to that, I suppose, is if you um, if this is really thin, you might distort it a little bit, and then so so then the, the next evolution was, which I haven't effectuated yet, 
is to take, I have a larger, maybe a this big ring that's about that thick. So I could make a manifold out of that. And, and then the trick would only be to center the plate on that manifold. The, the thing that jam chuck does for you is it centers the plate. Yeah, so after all of that, I come back around. I, I have a vacuum chuck and I use it all the time on holes, but um, this is easier. And it's a little imprecise, so you couldn't maybe tell that I could that that when I'm scraping this dovetail out, um, well, maybe you can tell, actually. It's not the same surface that was presented from the original screw chuck. Uh, it's not quite the same concentric roundness. And uh, I've, uh, I've cut into the surface a little bit here where it's skated across the surface here. So it's not oriented quite the same either. It never will be, I find. I haven't figured out a way to move from the front to the back orientation and have it be perfect. It hasn't, hasn't worked in my world. So, so I'm not surprised that that happens, but that's, that's a manageable uh, uh, situation. And the only part of this whole thing that I care about being accurate is this edge right here. The edge that it's going to sit on is the only thing that really matters a lot. The rest of it can be uh, whatever it is. It needs to be smooth and presentable, but the, the important surface is this one. So if there's a little bit of undulation here that's kind of managed by sandpaper, it's not the end of the world. This one's, this one's important because it has to sit flat when it's new. Right? Until you get it home, it has to sit flat. So. I think I think I covered everything I intended to. I'm happy to Good. ramble on. What, what's your food safe? Uh, food? I'm sorry. Oh. What do you use for food safe? Perfect. Uh, I use this product here, which is uh, it's a Howard product. It's butcher black butcher block conditioner, and it's it's the usual um, mineral oil and beeswax, but it also has carnauba wax in this one. And, and I like it, I think, because it's a little bit uh, shinier when you apply it several times in buff. Shinier than beeswax because it has the carnauba in there. And carnauba is resistant to moisture in a way that, that uh, beeswax isn't. So I think, I think you have two things going for you. The normal oil and water doesn't mix with mineral oil, plus you've got a little carnauba wax in there. And for me, it makes it more presentable on the shelf. And maybe it makes it more durable. Uh, a little bit longer lasting uh, oil treatment. I like that the best. I've also used, um, and I do still use sometimes, the uh, Mahoney walnut oil. I think that's a good product as well. Um, I had, when I first started using it, I had a little trouble with it curing in a way that I was happy with, but the latest batch I bought has been great. It, it soaked in, it cured, it didn't develop the sort of um, problems I had with uh, months before, so maybe I had maybe a batch that aged too much, sat on my shelf too long before I used it, that didn't happen. So, so I like that product as well. Is yeah. that a pure molten oil? No, it's it's um it's petroleum it's, 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 it's no it hasn't any petroleum but it's been um uh, heated and maybe even boiled, I don't know for sure, but it's it's been resolved in such a way that um it, it's it's not uh so nutty. It doesn't really have that sort of smell, it just has the little bit of sort of ingredients that are revealing. It, its main feature is that it actually sets up to a film. When does it go rancid? It doesn't. That's one of the features of the refining that they've done with it, whatever, whatever the refining process. It's a food oil which doesn't go rancid. No. And, and it, as I say, it does cure a bit, so it's not like mineral oil, which is always uh, wet, which, and much dust and so forth, maybe, if it's sitting on the shelf. But the walnut oil seems to have a, takes a bit of a, 
Sure, you use this. Yeah, I have one. Yeah, and it hardens up. It. Yes, There's, I would say it might go too long. As many as it wants. You know, um, if you watch Mahoney do it, he has a oh, he'll, he'll watch it, he'll, uh, a, a barrel that he soaks it in or something. But I, I don't do that. I, I have to light it. Out of I let it eat what it wants, and if it wants a little more, I give it a little more, especially the end grain, and then I let it dry for a couple of days and test it again. If it's thirsty, I give it another dose. Uh, uh, that's kind of the same thing I do with this um, this conditioner. This stuff is it, it has to be heated to be liquid. Right now, it's kind of paste in here. The beeswax and the mineral oil have kind of amalgamated. So you have to heat this up, but tap water will heat it up. You don't have to boil it, but you do have to warm it to make it be uh, fluid enough to put on and soak in. And it's the other thing I like about it is it's available. So if I if I sell something to somebody, I can say to them, I put this on it. If you want to put the same thing, you can get it at Ace or Menards or Rockler or Woodcraft. I don't have, they don't have to write to some manufacturer or somewhere like Mahoney or like Craft Supply <clears throat> and get Mahoney off. They can get this product off the shelf in any number of local retail establishments. Yeah, right. This is, this is a sample bottle. If you, if you buy a, a $150 platter from me, I'll give you this. <laughs> and say, bless your heart, here's, Thank you very much. here's, here's the little two-inch square piece of paper that tells you what I did, and this is a sample, and you can find it at these stores. But the, the other ones, the full bottles, lots bigger, are like nine or ten bucks a piece. And they're as good for anybody's cutting board or other bowl, salad bowls, they're as good as any other products. A lot of them are just mineral oil, beeswax, or mineral oil alone. This has got a couple of waxes in it. I think you can find that at Menards. Yeah, yeah. Menards has it. One of them. They, I've seen yeah, it there. It's not like a type. <clears throat> Some Aces have it. There are a number of uh, Howard products. Some of them are don't include the private wax. That's that's this one that's butcher block edition that includes the private wax. Okay. Thank you for that. I